So, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Professor Dr. Paul Dembinski. Professor Dembinski will be chairing this next panel discussion. He will be introducing the participants, the panelists, and I will leave it to him to start off and conduct the session. But as usual, I will stand up one minute before the session ends, in case he has not brought the session to a close. But uh, Dr. Dembinski tells me he should have been an astronomer. Now, that's an interesting sort of wish or uh, career that might have been. Maybe you'll be able to weave that into what you're doing mm. this afternoon. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Paul Dembinski. So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, dear friends, it's a pleasure to be today here in Zermatt and be able to introduce and moderate this panel about putting ethics back into the financial finance and banking. So each word of the title seems to have its own weight and uh, we are going probably to devise on each of them. What does it mean to put? What does it mean to put back? And what does it mean in finance and banking? And of course, after 2007 and 2008, finance has appeared as being the main culprit of the crisis and the lack of ethics in finance has been addressed by many as being the major cause of the crisis. Uh, although this thesis is debatable, uh, I think uh, a lot of things has been written, a lot of things has been uh, uh, heard, a little bit, a lot of, a lot of things have been also filmed about the issue of ethics in finance. You remember that uh, at, I think, the second meeting of G20, there was this French idea of saying moralizing capitalism, putting ethics into capitalism. As a good French cook prepares a wonderful plate, there is a small place where you find ethics and morality. You have to add it in order to spice a little bit the, the dish, and then the dish is morally uh, adjusted. So to what extent this kind of putting back ethics into finance we are going to discuss, it's an open story. Uh, you can see, I think, in the literature and in the general positions that have been taken during the last two or three years, two rather extreme views. One view I would uh, refer to Soros, who about 10 years ago, writing about the future of capitalism, had this very nice sentence saying, on the marketplace, everyone that has other considerations, that pure profit is dead. And I, when he was speaking about himself, himself, when I'm on the marketplace, I'm behaving exactly like this. What happens after the markets are closed? With, with my philanthropic activity, it's another story, he said. So he says, he argues, impossibility putting ethics into, let's say, the business world. Of course, the other extreme would be the recent encyclical by Pope uh, Benedict XVI, when he calls put gratuity into everyday business activity, not outside, not after, but into it. So there are these two extreme views, and I think we have a wonderful panel to discuss about these uh, views uh, with three speakers and three panelists coming from rather different horizons in terms of business and also in terms of, of their practice. So what uh, we have de decided as a, as a way of carrying this panel ahead would be to give five to seven minutes to if each, each of the panelists also to introduce himself from the professional perspective. You have a lot of details in the booklet, but I think to give some some profile in terms of professional terms, uh, and then to have, we have three or four questions, tra uh, um, transversal questions on which we are going to discuss and then opening, of course, discussion with you. So I would suggest with this first uh, start of, uh, st uh, first uh, five minutes of uh, discussion, if uh, Marie-Lou von goldstein Ruver, she is uh, with Triodos Bank, almost from the inception of the Triodos Bank, if I'm, if I'm right. Of the After 10 years. Yes, so, so it was a majority of the history mm. of the Triodos Bank. So if you could pick up uh, and introduce what, what 
seems for you being the ma main stones for the discussion about uh, putting ethics back into finance and banking. Yeah, thank you very much. And you have this wonderful <laughs> and horrifying instrument at the same time in front that. of you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, I can start by saying a few words on why I think we lost ethics in banking and why mm. banks currently are not serving the real economy. And I think this has to do with the current business model of most of the big banks. I mean, the business model really focuses on uh, banks making their money out of trading, trading securities, uh, trading derivatives, and not so much on uh, extending credits. And uh, I think this is one of the issues. And another issue is, uh, for example, also if you look at the compensation system of banks. I mean, this is completely out of balance with what is happening in the rest of society. If you take, for example, uh, the four top banks in the United States, then the average uh, salary uh, is, is six times as high uh, of what is earned in the rest of the economy. And that means that these banks are drawing talents uh, to this type of banking, and these talents are then lost for the more traditional banks, but also for the real economy, you could say. And this is all supported by a regulatory regime, which does not distinguish between what you could say is core banking and what is more, uh, I would say, the casino type of investment banking. And because there is no distinction, all the measures that are being taken by uh, regulatory uh, authorities are now also financially burdening uh, what is called core banking and thereby also uh, the real economy. And this is all driven, it's been said before, by uh, shareholder expectations, uh, shareholders uh, expecting short-term financial profits, uh, thereby driving these banks to take higher risks uh, and not... Uh, yeah, extending the credits that are needed to serve the real economy. And this is a vicious cycle that needs to be broken. And um, in Triodos Bank, we work with a different uh, business model. I would like to say a few words on, on, on that. Uh, in Triodos Bank, we see uh, banking as uh, a means to an end. Uh, we want to, uh, our mission is to make money work for positive uh, social and environmental uh, change. And uh, we do that uh, because we want to enable uh, people and institutions uh, to use their money uh, yeah, to work for positive change. And I think that's one of the important things in our business model. We try to connect savers and investors to real entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who are making a difference either uh, in terms of uh, yeah, care for the earth, uh, so all kinds of enterprises working with renewable energy, with organic agriculture, with uh, biodiversity, or uh, who are working, entrepreneurs who are working to create a more uh, socially equitable society. And we strongly believe that economic activity uh, can and should have a positive impact on, on our society, on the environment and on our culture. And in Triodos Bank, we have uh, four basic values that are sort of the, yeah, the, the, the heart of what we do and that provide a building block to yeah, what we are all about. And these four values are uh, sustainability, transparency, excellence, and entrepreneurship. Sustainability, as I said before, we only want to finance businesses and companies that are, have a positive impact on sustainability, transparency. We want our investors and our depositors to know exactly where their money goes. So on our website, we have a true Google Maps. You can see all the projects and all the businesses we finance. So a depositor, for example, he can look uh, at his postal code and then see what kind of businesses are financed in his neighborhood. So he knows that his money is being used for real entrepreneurs that he can visit, that he can make a connection to. So I think that's a very important value for us. Excellence is also an important value because we want to offer products that are really at the, well, in, the best in the industry. We want to be a professional bank. Um, so this is also value for us. And then last, the entrepreneurship. We want to be entrepreneurial ourselves. We want to constantly come up with new innovative ways of financing sustainable sectors. 
And we also want to finance entrepreneurs. And personally, uh, that's something uh, I enjoy very much. I think it's, I, I find it wonderful that in my job, I can help people reach their full potential as human beings, but specifically also as entrepreneurs. And uh, this is something that uh, I feel is, is sort of a, a key uh, and, and yeah, function of a banker and something that I personally uh, yeah, like, like a lot. And maybe just to give one example of uh, entrepreneurship for us as a bank ourselves, uh, for example, 20 years ago, when there was the Chernobyl uh, disaster, uh, we felt as a bank we need to do something to uh, make sure that in the future we don't need nuclear energy anymore. So we took the first steps to start financing wind energy uh, in the Netherlands. All the banks thought we were crazy, but at that time that was, yeah, for us, uh, something that we felt is, is absolutely necessary. And for me personally, um, uh, I was uh, working as a volunteer in 1993 uh, for Mother Teresa. She was mentioned by Father Boutet. And um, I was working there for five weeks in uh, one of her homes, the Home for the Dying. And I was really, uh, was for me a transformational experience. I was, was struck on the one hand by all the suffering, but I was also struck very much by, you know, people who really have nothing, uh, but they have, you know, this enormous will to live and to make something of their lives. So for me, it was like, what can I do to contribute that people have more opportunities? And, and for me, this was the start of, you know, the, the microfinance funds that we currently have. So, and I, we also encourage the, our staff to be uh, entrepreneurial and to sort of connect their own personal values to yeah, business opportunities for us as an asset manager, as a bank. So I think this is also something that we encourage very much with our co-workers. And then maybe to close, um, I think uh, we were talking a lot about responsibility. I think uh, putting ethics back into banking is not only the responsibility of bankers and regulators, but it's the responsibility of all of us. I think everybody is a banker. Everybody has savings or some investments. So I think everybody can ask, you know, what do you want your money to do? do you, are you looking for the highest financial returns or are you looking for ways to make your money work for a better society? Everybody has a choice. Thank you. Thank you. So, so ethics has always been a key word in uh, Triodo's activity, if I understand it right. So let's turn to Gilles, and, uh, who has a, another background. He's coming from a very large uh, French bank, Crédit Agricole, and uh, what, with uh, very strong also mutual, mutual, mutualist and cooperative tradition. So Gilles, please. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'll start from the same uh, starting point uh, as uh, Mary Lou, and uh, broadly to say that I fully concur with and agree with her view that uh, banks went too much into capital markets and that there was something deeply flawed with compensation schemes. And I, I would want just to put this in a, a global general framework and see where action can be taken. Um, the crisis resulted from massive global imbalances with uh, the Chinese savings financing the, the American way of life, to put things simply. These global imbalances were huge, they reached a size they had never had before. Uh, simultaneously, you had debt-driven growth uh, in the West, in the US and in Europe. Every year, the percentage of debt to GDP grew, and this was clearly uh, viewed as normal, and it was not normal, it was not sound, debt-driven growth. Debt-driven growth could happen to that extent because we were in a period where financial markets were being very inno innovative, were growing enormously. People thought that they were not too risky. They used very deeply flawed risk assessment tools. And as a result, you had an explosion of the size of derivatives markets. Then the crisis erupted on the basis of subprimes. And suddenly everyone understood that the system had become extremely fragile and the financial crisis triggered an economic crisis and we're still in that, in that crisis. So what should we do about it um, in, in two very different um, areas, regulations and ethics? And 
The point I would want to make is that ethics is vital to fix it, but is not sufficient. Regulation has to be a, a major uh, issue in how these issues are addressed, but it will not be enough either. It will need some ethical momentum to it. And that is what I would want to convey to you. What should be done about global imbalances? That's very difficult. No one ever had thought before the last uh, recent period, the last year or so, that you should address globally global imbalances issues. It became a topic on the agenda of the G20 less than a year ago. That means that states will be sitting around the table and discussing the deficits of the other states, making comments and taking commitments so that they will be curbing these imbalances. I think that is a vital thing. It was not a regulatory issue. It is becoming a regulatory issue today, and it's a major change. What should we do about financial markets? Well, I think an absolutely massive uh, problem is the one of flawed risk assessment in financial markets. And that has only been possible because incentives were so strong to use instruments that massively underestimate the risks you have on financial markets. So you have to be very active both on risk measurement, on how much capital you need when you have capital market business, but also on having the proper incentives. Flawed incentives, in my view, were not only an unethical thing to do, and I'll revert to that in a second, they were also a substantial portion of the reasons why the system grew to the size it grew to and why it was so risky and so fragile. We have to fix this if we want to get financial markets to be safer and more stable. So what should we do? Uh, I think uh, regarding financial markets, a lot is being done, uh, but we're at a considerable distance from where we should be. Um, and the number of areas where nothing at all has been done is still very important. I would say non-bank finance, this is extremely important. Many of you have heard the word shadow banking. Uh, when you say shadow banking, people think it's murky and it's uh, you know bizarre business. It's very normal business, but it's not regulated. And not being regulated means that it is remaining very dangerous when the banking system is becoming somewhat less risky than it was before. I think that's an important element. We should also have more transparency in over-the-counter markets. That is an area where massive risks are being accumulated. What should the ethical approach be? I think leaders in companies should do something uh, about their compensation schemes. And when they see that their compensation schemes are dangerous, that they are asymmetrical, that traders stand to make enormous money when things go well, and uh, shareholders, bondholders, or the taxpayers are to lose enormous money when they go wrong, they should step away from these schemes and they should accept that they will have apparently lower yields, lower returns on equity during some time, but they will have reduced their risk profile and it will not necessarily be contrary to their shareholders' interests. And this is, of course, something that is very difficult to maneuver because although you want to be ethically correct, you still have to serve to a degree your interests uh, and the interests of your shareholders. What uh, would we want to see in 10 years' time if we try to project ourselves in the distant future? Well, I think we would want global imbalances to be uh, reduced and to have a sounder macroeconomic view of the world. We certainly would want debt to be less of a major driver of growth than it has been in Europe and in the US. If you think of the rapidly growing countries of Latin America or Asia, they are not in a debt-driven growth model. We have in Europe and in the US to go back to a model that is less debt-driven. And we also have to make sure that we keep an ability to finance vital public services. And that means because it has become <coughs> unsustainable to have massive uh, deficits uh, for the states in Europe particularly, and also now in the US, we have to gradually go back to more balanced budgets in a way that will make it possible to keep decent public services uh, and have them financed in a way that is lasting. Where does ethic play a role? Well, leaders in the banking community and the financial community have rarely been very involved in supporting regulation. In some countries like the US, they have 
opposed regulation. I think they should become aware that bad regulation increases risks. When risks materialize, it is the weakest who suffer. So it is not only uh, of their own interest to reduce risk, but it's also a moral duty to support proper regulation. Thank you very much. And now let's turn to Xavier Pierre-Luca, who has an experience in microfinance, looking from all the sides of microfinance, from financing and for running microfinance. So the same rule, five, seven minutes of introductory remarks, and then we jump to the discussion. All right, thank you very much. <coughs> well, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, when I first read, actually, uh, uh, the subject of this panel, uh, putting back uh, ethics into finance and banking, uh, it somehow uh, surprised and, and scared me, I have to say, um, to a certain extent. Uh, I think that... Uh, Banking uh, finance is actually serving a function uh, in the economy, and uh, it has so far probably served this function, I would say, rather well. Uh, there have been uh, probably a few uh, exaggerations, and not a few, but significant exaggerations uh, in the last few years, uh, but which are probably not uh, linked to uh, banking and finance itself, uh, which so far has acted as a, an efficient mechanism of uh, intermediation in the economy to facilitate basically uh, an allowing excess of liquidities on one hand to be rechanneled towards uh, small and medium enterprises uh, and to entrepreneurs which have been innovative, which, has, uh, which have created service uh, products, uh, developed services that have been very useful to our society. Uh, so I think that uh, banking, and even today, is still serving this function properly. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the institution itself uh, that is uh, actually uh, lacking ethics. It's more the different stakeholders uh, that are part of these very uh, institutions. Uh, the shareholders, to start with, uh, directors and managers that are badly incentivized, I believe, uh, just like... Uh, uh, both my, my colleagues uh, mentioned today, uh, which have generated the sort of crisis that are forcing us to ask uh, these questions about uh, of ethics today. Uh, there are probably two ways no, to, to uh, make sure that the function is carried out properly. Uh, one is external, and uh, it's probably a function of regulatory uh, framework that is lacking in many different countries. Uh, I mean, we work in microfinance at Blue Orchard, and we see the lack of regulatory framework as probably the most uh, daunting challenge to the successful development of a banking uh, mechanism that is su sustainable and that is adequately serving the low-income uh, population in emerging markets. Uh, and the other is, of course, uh, internally, uh, asking ourselves as managers, as directors, asking our shareholders as well, uh, the questions about what they want, where they want us to go, uh, how do they want us to carry our mission uh, in terms of return versus social development can both be achieved at the same time, um, and uh, try to instill at every level of the company uh, the ethical values uh, that allow the mission to be carried out properly uh, in a positive way for the people, uh, for the low, in our case, the low-income uh, customers, uh, in other cases, just generally the general public. Um, Blue Orchard has had the luck, uh, I think, uh, to develop a business that uh, has a mission uh, which very core is focused on uh, the people themselves, on making sure that the lowest socio-economic socio segments of society are provided uh, with the financial services uh, that can allow them to develop productive activities and regain dignity or maintain a dignity in, uh, in the societies where they participate. Um, we've been uh, growing tremendously since uh, we started in 2001 with $10 million in, in their management to close to $1.2 billion today. Uh, I would rather say unfortunately, because it means that there are many poor still to serve, and uh, the growth that I think our organizations, not only Blue Orchard, but Triodos and, and many others, uh, that is to come, uh, is going to be probably quite significant as well. 
Uh, this being said, I think uh, most of you or who are maybe familiar with microfinance have seen that uh, the sector as a whole, uh, uh, which have been uh, actually looked at uh, a silver bullet to solve issues of economic development in many different countries uh, for probably seven to ten years, uh, the rise of uh, uh, Mohamed Yunus, the fact that he was uh, um, given the Nobel Peace Prize as well as uh, uh, facilitated also uh, the fueling of that growth uh, of institutions like ours and also the banks and the people that we, we are helping in these emerging countries. Uh, lately, uh, we've seen in the media a uh, very strong attack uh, on the sector itself. Uh, these attacks, of course, as a participant in the sector, an active participant, we believe, are, are not fully justified, but this being said, there is, of course, uh, no smoke without fire. Uh, and uh, the very uh, questions uh, that you are asking about banking and financial services operating uh, in Western uh, Europe, in the United States, uh, these very issues that these organizations are facing in terms of uh, growth relay to make sure that, for example, they can keep growing, they, ca they can keep delivering uh, an adequate return, or what we call an adequate return to our investors. Uh, these very issues, our industry, uh, meaning the social impact investing, which is looked at very positively in fora like this one, uh, we are um, experiencing as well. Uh, we have to ask ourselves the questions of growth. Uh, how do we need to grow? Uh, do we need to grow year on year, you know, with 100% uh, exponential growth like we've undergone in the past few years? Uh, what, what are the adequate levels of profitability for our firm, for our investors, uh, for the banks that we are serving and financing uh, in these emerging markets? How do we develop internally uh, a culture that typically in many of these organizations comes from one man who has had a vision uh, of actually serving the poor or making sure that they are provided with a, a back uh, with their dignity. How do we make sure that we institutionalize, uh, in a sense, uh, these values? Uh, how do we make sure that when, when we recruit uh, talents coming from business schools like Harvard, Columbia, INSEAD, uh, I mean, the, I'm just mentioning the probably the names that are uh, most well known. How do we make sure that they uh, follow, that they integrate a culture of uh, basically social mission and at the same time making sure that uh, we are delivering results to our investors, are growing and are competing uh, in a sector uh, where there are many entrants who want to participate? I think these are the questions that we are asking ourselves today. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it was very interesting for us to be invited to this, uh, to this forum uh, because we felt uh, we had many uh, of the answers that uh, were lacking actually the traditional banking and financial uh, industry. And uh, the history has demonstrated that uh, we, I mean, we still have to learn. Uh, and I think we are here and I am here today to learn also from these different uh, experiences from organizations like Credit Agricole, who probably have lived uh, many different cycles and different lives, uh, I mean, on the basis of uh, ethics and what it represents uh, in the banking sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have now, we know each other to some extent. We know the, the points of entry for the discussion. Uh, 15 years ago, the Observatoire de la Finance started uh, journal which is called Finance and the Common Good. And for 15 years I have been hearing the remark, it, this is incompatible. It is an oxymoron. And uh, here, well, uh, around this table and for since a few years, it seems maybe more compatible than it used to be seen uh, 10 years or 15 years ago. So maybe let's try to see the compatibility. That's the good news. But there is also a not so good news. The, I was uh, reading recently about 40 essays submitted to a prize ethics in finance coming from people younger than 35. And most of them are extremely, extremely reserved about the possibility of building ethics into finance, which is, which is a very, let's say, sad news from, uh, from the perspective of, of uh, these essays were written both by professionals and by, let's say, doctorate students or, or master students. 
And this uh, pessimistic view uh, is not compatible, probably, with the optimism that should the youth be carrying for our world. So this remark, this being said, let's try to see what are the topical issues. You have been mentioning a few of them, compensation, come, come back, transparency, but what are the key issues, not going for the moment to regulation, but key issues within the financial sector that have to do or that are good points of entry once again for ethics? What are the key questions? If you were to, to draw a list of three issues that financial institutions should look at, or business schools in finance departments, not in ethics department, but in finance departments, should look at, what would there be? There's three, three items, three headlines, three chapters. I don't know, who wants to start? I know that's not an easy question, but I'm, I'm sure there is plenty of ideas. Well, in, in financial departments, I would really open the dustbin, throw traditional financial mathematics in it, and uh -huh. uh, start with a better approach of risk. What has happened in the last few years are a series of events whose probability was one in a billion or one in a trillion years. Uh, when you say that with a serious face, you're saying that the theory is wrong. So if the theory is wrong, change it. Change your risk assessment measures. Once you will have done that, people will have less incentives to grow gigantic financial derivatives markets and you will have a system that will be less risky. So the first thing I would do is I would scrap the financial mathematics courses in their present form. Which would be <laughs> probably... <laughs> Not <would>, very popular. <laughs> which would probably mean a rather, rather important let, meltdown of the sector as such, but that's let, another story. Let, let me just tell you a story. Um, I had a discussion with a very famous financial mathematics professor in France um, two years ago. And she had been interviewed in the newspapers and she said in that interview that they were doing something that was completely correct, uh, but that only handled the 95% of the situations where everything went well. So I asked about the five remaining percent and they couldn't care less. Um, and that triggered my view, my radical view on what should be done. So change the assessment of uh, risk, the methodology, and probably the products that are linked to it. That's not Absolutely. a <laughs> So the first point, other ideas? Well, I think Marie in Lou. general, make finance less complicated. I mm -hmm. mean, what's being taught now at business schools uh, makes finance is, is, uh, has become very abstract, very complex. And I think we really need to go back to basics. Uh, finance in the sense of, you know, attracting deposits and making those deposits work. So finance is really about, you know, how do you extend credits? How do you make assessments of enterprises? What do you look at? How do you do that in, in a, let's say, in, in a responsible and, uh, way uh, that you do take risks? Finance is always about risk, but, but sort of controlled risk. And it has to do with assessment of opportunities you have to be able if you extend the credits and people have to learn that to uh, in a way to look the, to see the future you have to see future possibilities and see uh, you know if that is worthwhile to put your money into that and and these are qualities which are not being taught in in schools i mean we find when we hire people that these are really skills and qualities we need to teach them and they they learn that in practice, but I think, uh, well, financial education needs to be more about that. So make it more simple and more practical. Thank you. Practical. We, we have in a few days a faculty meeting, so I invite you to, <laughs> <laughs> to put forward yeah. this, this kind of ideas. Xavier? No, if I may, I think you, you, you were discussing uh, financial mathematics and uh, the analytics of it. Um, there's one aspect uh, uh, that is key uh, in finance, at least in what we do on a daily basis. It's uh, uh, making sure that we have the right discount rate uh, to value, I mean, equity, uh, debt, many different things, uh, companies. Um, I think these discount rates actually do not incorporate uh, many of the externalities, negative or positive also, that are being derived by organizations, companies, uh, um, tangential uh, to their core businesses. Uh, they do not take into account also the subsidies that um, the population as a whole 
actually, uh, you know, is, uh, is paying uh, to these different businesses. Uh, let's have a look at banks. I mean, uh, let's have a look at what happened uh, post-economic crisis, for example. I think when we are valuing right now, I mean, the stock of many of these uh, banks uh, on the capital markets, maybe we ought to take into account in our analysis of uh, income statements, uh, maybe the subsidies and the price the population has paid uh, to make sure that they are being kept afloat or, and maintained in the future. And uh, this is a very delicate, uh, probably, subject. There are many economists who are trying to tackle it uh, successfully uh, in, in many different universities, but it's very complex. Uh, it would be interesting, I think, uh, not to provide a formula to, to the students, but at least uh, to interest them uh, about uh, these different uh, subsidies and externalities and make sure that when they actually uh, carry with their tasks, uh, their operations at their desk, uh, they try to think a little bit about it. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, the audience and the participants to the summit are willing to add something to the list. We have been speaking about transparency. We have been speaking about uh, risk assessment. What you have been saying, I call a responsible lending to, to a large extent. And uh, once, one issue that has not been mentioned I would add to the list is the question of conflict of interest which is something very peculiar and very, I think, widely, widely present in the, most of the service industry, but especially in the finance industry. So if somebody wants to join this discussion in the room, yes, there is a one, two, there are many people around, so one mic here maybe, yes, shortly. I think uh, that's three, three points which might help to clarify the issues. I mean, I did a short training in banking once, and I was struck how very ethical banking is finances internally. I mean, if, if most people in, in finance didn't most of the time follow the rules but try to commit fraud, the system would collapse completely. So there is an internal ethics, but obviously not in the way society was treated. I also think it's too simplistic to say we had this uh, deregulation, we now need to regulate a bit more. Actually, it's more serious than that. I mean, the World Future Council Future Finance Commission is just looking into the fact that we actually regulated in a way to allow these so-called futures trading, these derivatives, which before in many countries were not legally enforceable because they were regarded as financial gambling. And we looked at the situation in Germany, Switzerland and, and Austria, and you actually had laws there which were changed or the interpretation was changed to make it possible to sell all these products because the argument was that the financial sector would then contribute more to GDP growth and that this was possible in the USA and therefore it must be possible in also in, 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 in Europe. And so laws were changed which enabled these, these gambling products to then be sold to local communities, etc., cetera, in, in Germany. And I think you know, to, we need to uh, reverse this. Then, of course, the argument is that a few of these products are good for hedging, etc. So you could have a positive list of those products which are allowed, but the others need to be, um, you know, need to be banned again, need to be treated as, 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 as I said, you don't even need to forbid them. All you need to make sure is that the, the contracts, just like in certain countries, you can go into the casino and play, and if you lose and you pay with a, with a check and it bounces, the casino owner cannot enforce it because it's regarded as gambling, it's not legally enforceable. If you make that for some, these financial products like we had until, you know, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, in, in many countries, then you will get rid of a lot of the problem. And lastly, why is this you know, not, not happening? Because uh, we have this pretense that um, this is contributing to, um, to welfare, to building wealth, but of course it's not. I mean, it's not just some of these projects that are a bubble. In many ways, the whole securitization on which finance has been building for the past 20, 30 years is an enormous bubble which is trying to prevent us from understanding for a few more years until the next collapse comes that we are not as rich as we thought we were. We built up these, this bubble economy which has no relationship anymore to the way real wealth is being produced. And the sooner you know, we start dismantling this again, um, you know, the, the, more, the sooner we are facing reality and can, can back to building real wealth within real parameters and real limits. Thank you very much. We take one or two other remarks from the, from the room. At the, at the end there, there is Yes. Um, good afternoon, my, my name is Jose Maria Simone from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm today a business manager in the agribusiness, agriculture production, but I used to be a banker for many years, so 
And all, obviously, I did a, did a lot of errors. So thinking on your question that w what is the key element or perhaps one of the basic elements, banking is based on confidence. <coughs> and confidence is truth. We are going back to one of the most important values. We are here in a summit that talks about humanizing globalization. If you talk about humanizing, we talk about a person. And a person cannot live without truth. But what ha this has to do with the banking system. The banking system cannot continue, and I think it has to be done, without telling the truth of their assets. People make deposits, but the deposits have to go to assets that can be explained, valued correctly, and on the other hand, expe is expected that the <coughs> return that are going to be produced for those assets are going to be able to pay back again to the deposits. I'm also an industrial engineer, so I'm very fond of my mathematics uh, professional, but I think that mathematics, it's a secondary uh, um, feature. You have to tell the truth on their assets and the mathematics will help you to explain, but not on the contrary. And this is what happened in the last crisis. Thank you very much. Another two. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, is this on? Yep. Yes. Um, Mark Drew from the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative. A question for the three of you. If, if you had to run your business in an economic system that could not grow, so we imagine that we actually can't have perpetual growth on a finite Earth. If you had to do that, if the w growth was no longer an option, what would you do differently? Okay, last remark, Antonin, and then we go to the panel. Um, yes, I just wanted to, to think a moment about the subject of the, of the theme of the, of the summit, which is servant leader. And when I'm asking myself, are the bankers led by servants, people at the service of their institutions and of the nations they are supposed to, to service? Um, and if we ask this question to many people, I don't think they are going to, to answer yes. I think they are servicing their own interest. They are servicing the interest of their shareholders. And they, by providing, you know, I would say, uh, service to the population at large, but the priority is clearly in their own interest and in the interest of their shareholders. And I think if they could open up a little bit the scope of the interest they are servicing, and in especially in uh, thinking about the consequences of, their, of the financial decisions they are making on the real economy, then maybe we would make a progress. I don't know. So thank you very much for this first round of reaction. I think adding to the, to the list of things to do or think about in terms of ethics, the remark about the role of accounting and valuation is close to risk management, but also to, to what extent figures are meaningful, to what extent they say the truth, is a very important ethical issue in finance. And we know that uh, it has been maybe to some extent over, overlooked by practices and also regulations. So I think that there is another important question that we should uh, dwell at. A in different interventions here, we have seen three levels of intervention. Macro level, regulation, imbalances, and so on. The, what I would call the meso level, the level of the institution as such. Some are gi gigantic, others are smaller. And then what uh, Nicolas Buté mentioned this morning, uh, this, at the beginning of, uh, of the session, the personal issue. So, what are the key problems in linking these three, the three levels of intervention uh, together? It's very easy to say it's up to the regulators and then the world we follow. Or it's very easy also to say we should all be heroes. We are not, well, the market that takes care of it and everything will be clear. But we nevertheless have these three levels of uh, possible intervention. What can, what should, what is being done on each of them. Once again, I turn to the, to the panel. What should, what could, 
what is being done. Well, Marilu? Maybe to start with, with your question and, and link it also to the theme of the conference, uh, what I like very much is the whole notion of, of statementship and that everybody uh, sort of also has the responsibility to work on that level. And that's how uh, I think we should all try to connect the personal level uh, more to the, let's say, to the, to the macro level. We, we do need, uh, and, and if I take that um, for my own bank, uh, and what we try to do, uh, well, in the Netherlands, but also more on a global scale, is uh, in the Netherlands, uh, through uh, the association of banks, and uh, through the association of banks, then sort of try to work with the politicians and look at what are the changes that we need in the regulatory framework to prevent, you know, another crisis. So I think that's, that's how you can connect it and maybe also pick up on the, on the, first, uh, the first question. Uh, if you see what is needed uh, in this regulatory change, I think one of the key things is that we have to de-link the depository guarantee schemes from the investment banking. I mean, that was sort of, has been, uh, used to be a law in the United States and also some European countries, has been reversed in the past 20 years. I think that's one of the first things that we need to re-establish so that uh, all this investment banking is not being done with deposits which are guaranteed. So I think that's one step. Um, maybe just uh, one, one more comment on compensation, because this is a very important issue, I think, today, and we, we have to be aware that um, all these banks that were paying massive salaries to their traders were not run by horribly immoral people. They were run by people who thought they were running such hugely profitable businesses and that it was legitimate to pay very high salaries to the little mathematical geniuses. Uh, and uh, the reason why they thought that was that their risk assessment was flawed. So you have perfectly normal, normally ethical people who went into those compensation schemes, made a fortune or distributed fortunes uh, without understanding that they were wrong in their risk assessment and that when adding, aggregating what was being done in every single bank in the world, you are creating huge systemic risks. And at the end of the day, when you have huge systemic risks, it's the taxpayer who is at risk. And the taxpayer, that means everyone and also people who are poor or not very well off and who are going to pay uh, because you've paid too much. And that is the reason why I singled this apparently Baroque item of mathematical finance because I think it was the tool that enabled the system to grow unchecked. Uh, and this happened although people thought they were doing normal business in a normal, decent business way. Just one comment on securitization. I think it's a technique. Um, I don't think it's bad or good per se, but it was part of those systems and those new techniques that made it possible to further grow the economy with increased debt and always pushing back the stage where you would have to come to the conclusion that if you don't have proper savings, you can't finance growth. Uh, America has been a no-savings country during a decade, and that was in part made possible by the fact that the Chinese savings were financing it, in part possible by techniques such as securitization. And that is why you should be cautious about these techniques, but what you want to fix is global imbalances. I think... There is a consensus that compensation is an important issue. When you read the financial press, you will find more declaration saying, well, we would like to change the rules of compensation, but for competitive and competitive reasons, we cannot. E each bank or each big bank is willing to say, we would very much do it, but we cannot because the other guys there will attract the best. That's the normal argument in Switzerland, in Germany, in France and everywhere. So how to start to cope with this? You are in a privileged position because your bank maybe is not so big, so you have a freedom of maneuver. I don't know how it is in, in microfinance, how it is in the large banks that you are used to. Who should start? Because everybody agrees, provided everybody moves. And as nobody moves, nothing happens. So how to get out of it? 
Yeah, I think it is a difficult issue. I think uh, we are in a different position, but what I do see, if I see at the people who are applying for jobs with us, I mean, many people, um, I mean, they, they are really looking for a place to work where uh, they feel connected to the value. So I think we also have to realize that, you know, find money is not the main motivator for people. So if that sort of thinking sort of reaches also the big banks, I mean, and you have to ask, if you are only hiring the people who are motivated by, you know, the highest possible salaries, are these the people that are best serving the banks uh, that we need to become? <laughs> so, so you are back, I'm afraid, yeah. to the incompatibility question somewhere. Yeah. Xavier, what would you say about this issue? From microfinance, maybe it's another perspective, but it's important perspective. Well, it actually is, is a very much a perspective for us uh, as an asset manager, but it is also more specifically a perspective and uh, something that is quite important for uh, the loan officers that are actually responsible on the field in emerging markets, working for different microfinance banks, to assess the credit worthiness of uh, the lowest uh, socioeconomic segments of the population uh, and make sure that they are served adequately. Um, their compensation is often based, uh, and our compensation is based basically on not only the growth that we can deliver, the clients that we can add to a portfolio, the profitability of these different uh, accounts, but uh, also basically the social performance of these different organizations. Are they adequately uh, serving a population in need? Uh, and this is key. Uh, for us in the way uh, we uh, recruit, uh, train, and, and, and compensate. It's a part of kind of assess professional, normal professional assessment, yes? Yes. And what about big banks? Well, we, we've, gone, we've gone a very long way in, uh, in a direction to uh, reduce the impact of these problems. We have massively reduced our exposure and our activity in uh, sophisticated derivatives and capital markets. Uh, we have de-risked the bank in that respect. And as a consequence, uh, we are also in a situation where we will less and less be uh, uh, forced into serving these huge compensations on the basis of if we don't them, we don't do them, we won't have the talent. And the second thing we've done is that managers now have um, in their compensation schemes rules that take into account objectives that are not only bottom line linked. This is an issue we were discussing uh, already, uh, and I think more and more organizations are accepting that it is normal that a portion of the compensation should be, should be linked to things that have to do with values, with what you're bringing to the community, with what you're bringing to long-term uh, development. It can take various forms. It can be on sustainability, on management, on human resources. You have a wide range of choices but you have to start at some point, and we have started doing that in the bonus schemes of the management of the whole group. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a sign, this discussion here has been a sign of hope because people and institutions can do such things without waiting for regulation and uh, common regulation on the, on the world level. So uh, we have uh, six minutes to go for uh, this, this panel, and I would like to ask a last question. What, how you see the issue of ethics and finance in 10 years from now? So we are starting the journey. We have been uh, witnessing how bad the things can go without ethics. Where will we stand in 10 years from now? Are there signs of optimism? Are there changes or kind of muddling through? Well, one major difficult uh, area in my view is uh, sovereign debt. Uh, Sovereign debt has become the major issue in Europe, <laughs> and it might be the major issue in America tomorrow, uh, particularly if the infighting between uh, the two parties goes on to an extent where people start being frightened by the AAA status of American debt, and we're every day getting a bit closer to that. I think at the end, I hope they will fix it, but this is a, a major issue. I hope that in 10 years' time, it will have been fixed in a way that will not have generated a new major shock wave. And today, I don't think we can you know, rule out the possibility that a poor handling of sovereign debt issue would create a tremendous shock to real economy. This is something we're experiencing today about the Greek situation in Europe. 
I hope that we're going to find something that gets us out of it. But if we don't, in 10 years' time, we'll be in dire straits. I hope that we will be in a situation where extravagant growth of the derivative markets will have been curbed. And as a consequence, you will have less extravagant salaries for those people running those derivatives. And if we cannot directly act on the derivatives markets, let's, ask on, let's act on compensation. Because the main lobby in favor of derivatives is the people who make it. Uh, now, let's be clear. Uh, derivatives are not very useful economically when they're very sophisticated in general. I don't want to be you know, too broad, but very often they're not very useful to anyone but those who manage them. Marie Lou? I think we will see an increasing number of smaller local banks. And I think uh, that's, that's a trend uh, that is already starting. And uh, banks who are uh, crucial for financing the local economy, I realize also we didn't answer your question on uh, no economic growth. I think that's something uh, that these banks will work on, uh, financing local economies that are not uh, dependent on using natural resources that we will face. I mean, we are already facing the end of that, so we need to rethink the economy as such. And these local banks will be uh, key drivers in that. Um, we are part of a network, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, which is now still small with 15 banks uh, throughout the world. Uh, and we are uh, aiming to increase that network to about uh, 100 banks in the coming years. So, and, and I hope that all these banks will be part of that, uh, yeah, that network and working to serve the local economies. So the melting down of the financial giants, we could say, yeah. as being an ethical step. It's very interesting to link the size to ethics. I think it's a very important point. I, I believe, I mean, you, you started by saying that uh, you, you, you've seen that people under 35 were very pessimistic uh, about uh, ethics into banking or into finance. Uh, I think that the forthcoming generations and the generation of the, that is in their 20s at the moment uh, will not accept uh, probably the way business is, has been carried forward so far. Uh, I think that we are seeing many talents coming to, to work for our company who have studied in very uh, prestigious universities who are not seeking only uh, high compensations, uh, high profits. I think we are looking at a generation that is uh, more and more aware of basically the impacts of their um, activities on uh, society, uh, generally speaking, and we are very much <coughs> interested in making sure that uh, they participate positively uh, in uh, society. Uh, so I, I'm very positive that the organizations that are still not revising uh, their code of ethics, which are not incorporating in their governance uh, certain aspect of moral of, or, or ethical values, uh, will eventually be forced to do so. Uh, by a generation that is rising and which will not accept anymore uh, the way it's been done so far. If we put together all the issues and uh, suggestions that have been articulated this afternoon here, we aim for a major and fundamental revision of the finance business model. That's only this. So ethics, we started with ethics and then we reshuffled the house around the ethics. So once again, I think it, we see how important it is to put these convictions, these values at work at the individual level and at the meso level, leaving probably the macro level for the time being to the politicians to the extent they understand something in the, in the financial world. I'm looking terrorized at the watch. We have one minute left and I will end by thanking the panelists and reminding a conference we had uh, 20 years ago almost in Jerusalem about the Jubilee, the Jubilee tradition where every 50th year all the debts were erased and so on and so on, cancelled and so on. At the end of the conference, somebody said, well, but maybe in the old Jewish tradition, the Jubilee was playing in an orderly way the same function that a major financial crisis plays or can play in our developed world. It was almost 20 years ago, and these words uh, keep coming back to me since 2007. So thank you very much for your participation. I hope we are not going to the major financial crisis, crisis again, provided we take seriously the, the theme of the, of the panel, 
putting ethics or putting back ethics into finance and banking. Thank you very much.